All right, on this special edition of Big Drive Energy, we've got recurring guest. This is a this is a coast to coast pod. I am currently in dead ass middle of the country, Denver, <laughs> Colorado. We've got Mitchell from Morristown, New Jersey, East Coast as it gets. Andy out in Oregon, about as wet. How far are you from the the water out there? Uh, hour and twenty minute drive. It's, so yeah, it's we, pretty damn close. We We're got the coast to coast. We have got the entire yeah. country covered. <laughs> And for those of you guys listening to this, uh, we will be posting this on the DNVR Sports YouTube as well. Our good friend Andy here is going to do some, we're going to do some swing demonstrations, so you'll be able to see that. Um, And listen to the pod, of course, as well. We're going to talk about all these things, talk through these. So if you listen to it and want uh, the visual and demonstration, head over to the DNVR Sports YouTube where all that will be. And you get to see this sexy beard and, and face that's sitting in front of us. Uh, before we get into any of the golf and and all these fun specifics, Andy, how you doing, man? It's been a little over a year since we talked to you, I think, right around that. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so, something like that. Uh, oh, this is back in middle of the year, I think. Maybe it's not quite been a year, but uh, so, doing great, man. Doing great. Uh, everyone around these parts, Pacific Northwest, they're getting pretty pumped for the golf season. So my schedule's just like crazy right now. People wanting their uh, lesson before they go play. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about a lot of this on our podcast and kind of one of why we wanted to have you on in this perfect time of year is people in our state, specifically that we live in Colorado, are kind of getting into golf. What does it look like up there where you live? Like, are, Can you play in the winter? Is there a ton of snow? I know there's different pockets of areas that have snow in the Northwest, but overall, like, is it just like shit golf right now? or is it Because here it's like basically no golf until the last couple of days. Right. It, it's like swamp golf, really. Uh, so you get your days where we get like, funny enough, we just had record snow since like 1942 just happened. So courses have been closed for about a week, but that's pretty abnormal. The The snow doesn't really stick too much, uh, but the, we get a lot of rain. So you got certain courses that are, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old or more that did not put drainage in too well, or, you know, don't have the funds to, you know, keep packing the sand with or the course with sand. So uh, it's just swamp golf for probably another three months. And then, then we have perfection from, you know, June to November, honestly. That, that is so sick. And I, I can tell you from growing up in Colorado, uh, the saturated golf course is not something we generally run into. And no. as you know, I've, having gone to college out here and everything, uh, well, in Colorado, I'm currently not right. there, obviously. Uh, but yeah, Colorado, it, it's never really swampy, so we don't know what that's like. I think a lot of courses would give their right arm to have a water problem because uh, we yeah. have the exact opposite. But there, there's definitely like, I'm sure it just depends how into it you are, like everyone and your dedication. But I hate playing in the wet, cold rain. Like, you can't keep your hands dry. You can't grip the club. And it's one of those where even if you can go out and play, you you don't really gain anything from it. In your, You know, you usually end up walking away pissed off and, like, why did I just Pretty do much. that? Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a, a lot, lot of that negatives. goes on. Yeah. I, tell, I do tell my students, like, you got to go play just to be on a tee box, just to be in a fairway looking at a green. I teach fully indoors now. Uh, which has been amazing. Um, but, you know, they have to, it, they're not going to be any better if they do not step on a golf course at least a few times throughout the winter. And I know that's for us up here. I understand in certain parts of Colorado, you don't have an option. So indoor golf is probably your best bet. Uh, but even that, it helps because in here, we still visually see a fairway and we visually see a green. And so you, you see your shock shape still in here. Uh, yeah but yeah yeah, if you yeah that's i think what we're going to get into a little bit today is like okay if you don't have any of those options you can't go play indoor golf uh then how do we still get better that'll be that'll be pretty fun today for sure yeah so one thing we wanted to hop into before we get into other instruction is kind of talking about our favorite swings on tour uh and guys that we think either have you know just a great move at it or uh, all of us actually landed on three different guys with great tempo. Um, so I'll start out. We've got a video here of Chris Kirk 
Uh, I'm very partial to this guy now, especially after he just hit me a uh, 35 to one ticket on DraftKings this past weekend in the uh, Honda Classic. Extremely sketchy scenario. Uh, if you guys <laughs> saw on the 18th hole, he had basically had to make par. T- he ended up having to make par. It didn't look like it in the moment because he played first and he hit a ball in the water. It almost bounced. It bounced off the rocks on the 18th green and almost into the Honda that was out in the water. Um, which would have been an interesting scenario if it would have stayed up there. I don't know if he could have, like, took in a little boat out there to play that, you know, play it as it lies, hit it off the top of the right. CRV out there. Um, but his his move all day watching him Sunday, of course, you know, I'm sitting there with this bet. Obviously, want the guy to win. Our units have been getting pounded this year in not a good way. And so I'm like, all right, we need a winner. We need a winner. Um, but watching him swing it on Sunday, he has such great tempo. And it's almost like you almost feel like he's – pausing at the top and he's got just a mover I kept thinking like oh he's nervous and then when you watch him do it I mean obviously he is nervous but when you watch him do it for the entire four hour round you can see that it's just his move and so uh Kale if you want to pull that up for us real quick um so he yeah he takes it back a little bit outside of course he he's actually got some crazy head motion in his golf swing um, but when he brings it down, he's just got that perfect tempo. And it's one thing that we'll probably get into a little bit more as we get into each of these different golf swings. But you don't necessarily have to be at every perfect angle, but you it, it's it's not a disqualification if you're not at every perfect angle, but almost all of the time, it is a disqualification of your golf swing if you don't have good tempo. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I think we all kind of landed on these guys for a reason. And part of my reasoning is, is my, like, I, I think, well, and a lot of people don't understand, like, the difference of rhythm and tempo, too. But, like, all these PGA Tour guys are in rhythm because you can't hit a golf ball at the level they do if your swing is completely out of rhythm. But some guys have a quicker rhythm, like, back in the day, Nick Price was one that came to mind. And, and just a few dudes that were really... What'd you say? Sorry, uh, Matt Fitzpatrick. He's like currently yep, like, fit, he's yeah, there perfectly you go. Fitz- in rhythm, but his tempo is lightning fast. It, it, exactly. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people don't get. And like, I almost, I always like to explain it like it's a song. Like, a song can have a fast tempo, but it's still in rhythm. And then vice versa, where it, as long as everything stays in rhythm, you know, you can have a quicker tempo. But for me personally, like, my tempo has always been pretty quick back and quick through it. So I just, I'm jealous of these guys that just make it look so silky and effortless. Very, very frustrating to watch them swing after swing after swing. And I think yeah. uh, it's, it's good for people to watch. I tell my students all the time to watch it, uh, but they get frustrated quickly because they can't replicate it. But that's because they have not practiced that 40 hours a week for the last 25 years. So Exactly. Yeah. Um, so Spence, are you, so you got your guy and yep. do you want to pull up your guy next? So yeah, we'll go, we yeah, Xander, Xander Schauffele. So here's a, so we got a, a little, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, this is the quicker version of his swing and then we'll go to a super slow-mo of it. Good. So pretty, yeah. So we know for sure that his tempo, anybody that's listening to this, go watch him hit wedges. It's one of the prettiest things ever. Um, oh wow, yeah, we are going. We go, We do got slow mo here. Uh, that is slow. That is. That's okay. So I mean, if people are watching this, what they could take away from this is his takeaway. It's super straight. He's getting that club out away from him, which is really important. And when he does that, he's going to be turning his torso really well. And he's going to get a full turn, shoulder turn, back behind the ball. If he reaches the top position, it's, you know, it's kind of considered perfect. He's got a super loaded right hip ready to fire down. His arms across his shoulders a little bit. Here's what I watch. Watch his knees. Watch his hips. They're already moving to the target, and that club head is the last thing to get there. He's not a big dude, but he hits it funny far. That's what I think is the, it's the money move in the golf swing is how to start from the ground up and learning how to keep the club head behind you. It's super uncomfortable and definitely seek out some help to get that done. You can only get so much out of a 30 second TikTok, but uh, I make them anyway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you kill it. But uh, 
Well, that's that's okay. one question I wanted to ask you, Andy, is looking at Xander's swing, and like you just touched on, there's so much of him that is when you just if you were to take a still frame of him basically probably three quarters of the way through his downswing, you that's not a move you see from basically any, any amateur because they're trying to no. stay like closed as long as they can because they've heard, you know, 90%, I don't know what the exact number is, but let's say 90% of golfers that just start out are, are fairly good slice the ball. There's many different things that go into slicing the ball, which we can get into. But one right. of the things is everything is so open for them that they have no chance to let the club head go anywhere but across the line. Now you have to have open club face, other things, of course. But sure. what is what is the biggest key for Xander and for professionals that make it look like this, that it's so hard for us to make it look like that? But what is what is the key from, a, I guess, a plane and, and a rest of the swing standpoint that allow them to be in a successful position and hit the ball as well as they do, being that, for lack of a better term, open when they make contact or when, they're, when their downswing is already in, in motion? Are you, are you talking about, like, what do the pros do that allow them to do that? Or what is, like, the amateur missing? No, or both. Or both. Yeah, let's go into both. So, I mean, clearly there's 3,784,000 parts of the golf swing that you can touch on. Um, when – put it this way. I think, I think amateurs, when that club gets out of their vision, so the club starts right in front, they can see it, they're super comfortable – and as soon as they take that club back and it gets wrapped around their head, they, two things, they have no idea where it is or where it's supposed to be typically. Uh, and so something's going to get out of position. But even before that, I think that when it's out of their field of view, it's extremely uncomfortable. It causes like a moment of anxiety. And so they rush that club back in front of them because it feels like control. It's like, oh, I can see that now. But what happens is there's no sequencing to it whatsoever. They huck that club back in front of them. Things are out of position. You know, their club face is going to be out of position almost always. Um, but it's their automatic reaction to this feels like control. I'm going to hit this better if I do this. And then what better players have discovered is like, no, leave that club back there. Stay coiled up and start moving towards the target with the rest of their body. And then, you know, we'll, we'll figure out the rest later. But when the people get that, that body motion down and they, use their legs and their torso. And the last thing to come through is the club head. You, I mean, instant distance pick up right away. Club head speed through the roof, but their, their internal like effort level feels like 80%, 75%. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to say like, they're just so uncomfortable at the top and they don't even reach the top. They just huck the club back there and they have underturn their shoulders. They've, uh, breaking down elbows and wrists because it feels like a nice long swing where they're maybe you're going to get power, but then they huck that club right back in front of them. And there goes our sequence rhythm. It's all gone. It's a weak swing, you know? Yeah. I, I would, I would say that's mostly what I see like with amateurs too, is first of all, they don't make a big enough turn to create the speed that they are looking for. Um, they're all, they're trying to create all of it with their arms. And then secondly, they're, uh, their club face is just too open to allow them to rotate that way. They have no ra rotational Correct. freedom. So getting that club face a little bit more square is like step one. And step two is, is really allowing your, your right hip to, to turn back around you and to straighten that right leg a little bit, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of guys that I've talked about on the pod multiple times, but like Jason Day um, tries to like restrict, it, restrict his hip turn and it's right. hurt him throughout his entire career because it puts some strain on your lower back. And I mean, loading into your right side looks different for a lot of people. Like nobody's ever going to completely straighten their right leg and have their right hip completely behind <laughs> them, like facing away from the target. But right. if you're actively trying to like keep your knees like firm and your hips square to your square in front of you, then that's going to produce a lot of uh, hands too high coming outside in and then the club face being too open. So that's, that's like, I think some of what you're talking about too, but the crazy thing for me with Xander watching his swing is, and a lot of people can't reproduce this and this is why he's making millions of dollars on tour is <laughs> his hips at impact are like f almost facing the target and his right. shoulders are almost square like to, to his setup yeah. line where where he he's he, his hips are so flexible that he's all the way open at impact but his upper body isn't opening that way too so 
that allows him to attack it more from the inside. Whereas if his shoulders were that far open at impact, he'd be pretty much either down the line or path probably going a little bit to the left. So that is 100%. one unique thing with him where it's just like, I don't know if you can tell somebody to try to recreate that. Cause that's just not something that uh, you're, je- you're, you're, run-of-the-mill amateur can do on a physical basis but yeah talent wise like that dude you watch him it it looks so effortless and kind of that's the theme of all the swings that we picked here but uh yeah Yeah. that that guy's a lot of fun to watch swing it well so good so one one question i had for you both you guys kind of just relating to what andy just touched on and something i haven't really thought about shows you what a great uh teacher i am but do you guys think a lot of the restricted motion from amateurs is related to the fact that like they're scared of like over rotating to where they like don't aren't in the peripherals of the ball? You know, granted, like these professionals, they can easily turn and look at the ball or they don't even really need to look at the ball to hit it. But a lot of amateurs are so focused on the golf ball that that restricts a lot of what they do back and even swinging through it. Totally. Uh, yeah, couldn't agree more with that. Clearly, there's some cases where they physically cannot do it. They need to go, yeah. you know, see a trainer, work on their mobility, that type of stuff. And when I get a student like that, like I'm not a personal trainer, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that makes two of us. And so I will suggest it to them every time. I'll give them business cards of people that I trust. Um, but in the long run, if they don't do it, they don't do it. So uh, we find ways to work around it with those people. But yes, back to your question or point is like, I, I truly believe it's a, it's something that they freak out about when the club disappears and their body turns, turns, turns. And they're like, oh, it's, it's like a, a nervousness or something. And so they just stop it immediately because so they can, even though they'll maintain eye contact with the ball, it's like their, their brain doesn't think they will. So they just cut it short. And so they never get deep enough in the backswing, almost ever. I mean, rarely do I have to teach someone like, oh, whoa, hey, don't turn that far. You know, that they're a five percenter. The other 95%, I'm like, all right, let's, uh, let's start turning. I know you're going to whiff it a couple of times. You're going to top it. But believe me, for the greater good, and what do you know, a couple sessions in, they're, I've never hit my seven iron this far. I've never hit my driver this far. And the cool thing is it starts to naturally control their swing path when they turn better. And so they get a addition of distance, and they start hitting it straighter almost immediately. Clearly, there's other things to fix. But that's a big one is just getting themselves comfortable with turning, getting back behind the ball is a great start. If you are like, I don't know why I suck at golf, like, an easy one to start with you know for for me not having to see the swing that people can start working on that right away yeah i i agree there 100 percent. and it almost goes back to the old adage too of people get so focused on quote unquote keeping their head down that they feel like they they have no yeah i see your reaction there like <laughs> yeah your head good down. lord i've been saying it for years it's the the biggest bullshit fallacy in sport golf instruction yeah. um it's rough and obviously there's, you, you can't stand straight up out of it, but it's more about maintaining a spine angle and things like that. But you don't need to, I see so many people cut their backswing short and their follow through short, trying to keep their head down and it's not allowing you any rotational freedom. So like you, your head can move as long as you're sta- maintaining that spine angle and, and you're not standing up out of it and throwing your hips forward and bringing right. the spine up, whatever. But um, totally. Yeah, I think the going back to it, everyone in the driving range, how many times do you hear? And that's just my general gripe with golf instruction. And I guess it it keeps you in a full time instructional position. And um, <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> I, I can teach as many lessons as I want because you you have every forty handicap. You have the blind leading the blind. Essentially, you have somebody going out with someone else that knows nothing about golf, and they're like, "Teach me how to do this." So that yeah i think everybody just goes back to being like oh i need to keep my head down and in reality that's just not a fact at all so if you can take one thing from anything i say today it's just don't keep your fucking head down like you you can (laughs) yeah it's not you can move you can move or let your body turn let your body move you don't just Mm -hmm. need to be a a scarecrow sitting out there stiff as a board like that that's not going to do you any good so yeah, you're, I always tell my students, your eyes are independent of your head. So as long as your eyes maintain eye contact with the ball, which, by the way, all you listeners, 
you don't do that. You probably think you do, but you don't. Do yourself a favor. Next time you hit a golf ball, keep your eyes locked on one spot on the ball throughout your whole swing. It's a lot harder than you think. But you can keep your eyes on the golf ball and move your head. Like, that's fine. It, it, exactly. Moving, but my eyes are not. Yeah. So I, I like that okay. analogy. I've never thought of it like that. Yeah. All right, Mitch, let's get to your guy. So we'll start out with the Ryan Palmer swing. Um, and then you also have a short game one of a guy that's just a complete wizard around the greens. So uh, the Ryan Palmer swing, once again, if you guys are listening to the audio version of this, appreciate it, of course. But hop on to the DNVR Sports YouTube and check it out. We've got uh, three beautiful faces here for you, as well as some uh, good golf swings to go over. And at the end of this, Andy, we'll get into some things that you'll want to be on the YouTube checking it out in order to get these helpful tips. So, all right, let's roll the Ryan Palmer swing. Uh, the white driver on the left is terrible, but yeah. So it's the uh, one on the left is going to play. Is that that's the okay, one that's perfect. going slow mo? The one on the right is just his setup, and then it jumps into that. But so this dude, I mean, God, I, I can't believe it. His club face is actually that shut. <laughs> but he's shut. been, good God, that thing is facing the sky. Uh, I did not see that, but really good position at the top. That trail elbow is definitely. Uh, out racing his um, his forearm, he's externally rotated on that trail shoulder, which I just love. And like he he's just very good at staying connected. His his entire structure is very connected. Like you see that uh, drill that a lot of people do that we might talk about later, where you're putting towels under your your armpits um, to keep your arms connected to your body and utilizing more of your body to turn. Um, which will be probably a theme of this episode, but his his body doesn't his arms don't go anywhere without his body. There's no he, he's keeping everything out in front of him because he's turning so well that even at the top of his backswing, his hands are right in front of his chest. He's just made a really good turn back away from it, and then you can see as he releases, there's no hands flipping over. There's no you know because his club face is in a strong enough spot to allow him to do that. So yeah. he's continuing to rotate through. He's staying in his spine angle really well. And he just swings it so buttery. Like, I just love watching the guy swing it, even though he really hasn't had that much success in recent years. Um, but, I mean, he's been out on tour for 15, 20 years. So, you know, he's got the game to, to back it up. And I just really enjoy watching that dude swing it. Yeah. Yeah. One thing uh, that, well, you notice right away, his club face was super shot. And, um, it's super shut, but then it's like, okay, then how is he so successful? And it goes right back to that move that we saw with Xander. It's like the only way to control that type of club face is to turn through it like crazy. And that's yep. what he does. So it's like DJ-esque. It's like those guys have insane hip rotation. So that that's that right there is a difference maker between a, a, a really high-level player and an amateur. It's like even if you taught that amateur to rotate well, but the club, their body and brain like won't let them if their club face is wide open. It just, it'll, it'll literally hit the brakes on them. Like, nope. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Cause that's going to go two miles. Right. So yeah. 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 A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's, that's where I think like, obviously there's not one perfect way to swing a golf club, but this day and age, you maybe see a handful of dudes really playing good golf on tour with a neutral club face at the top. And most of the time it's working into a stronger position on the way down. Like when you see a dude with his club parallel to the ground on the downswing, you rarely see that thing filleted wide open unless they're trying to hit a 20 yard flop shot. Um, right. Their club face is in a strong position because that gives you the rotational freedom. And like you said, Andy, it's like, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. Like you have to, you have to have a strong club face in order to have that rotation, but in order, you know, it's, you have to have both. And I think when right. you just give people, when you strengthen their grip or when you add some flexion into their, their wrist and they're seeing that ball go left, they're like, holy shit, I can actually control my ball flight by my rotation instead of like manipulating yep. it at the bottom and pivot stalling. Like I can just turn harder, which like you said, yep. creates more speed on top of controlling accuracy. So it's, it's kind of a no brainer from like a, a standpoint of why shouldn't I, unless you're not physically capable of turning like that, why shouldn't right. I strengthen my club face, even if it's just a little bit, because it's going to give you, we haven't even talked about spin and compression and all this, but a little bit more of a closed club face is going to deliver a little less loft to impact, 
which is going to take some spinoffs. You're not hitting those those high pop ups to right field. You know, you're hitting those right. those laser right. beams with no spin on them. And there's just so many benefits to to strengthening the club face. And um, but like you said, if you, you can't really learn how to turn until you are into that point where you're rewarding yourself for making a full turn and actually rotating through the ball. It's like right. a reward. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 100%. Oh man! If only if only it came automatically, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I one thing that you said I really like, and it's like a goal for me for like as many students as I can is to control their club face with their rotation. And it is, gosh, when they get it, it it is sounds like nothing you've ever heard before, especially that they have never heard before. And it is a great thing, and it, it becomes a little bit more black and white as to why their ball went left or why it went right. I'm like, hey. Like your timing was off, you you turned not nearly enough, so you continue to hood it. You know, this is assuming we fixed the club face and stuff already. Um, and I said, just just turn a little bit more, get your belt buckle out there a little bit sooner, not faster, just sooner, and then boom, just dead straight laser. And I'm like, that's it. You just figured out the golf swing. You know, <laughs> exactly. It, you're like, you're yeah. good now. Yeah, let's get a beer. And exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the last video we'll get to here is uh, the Cameron Smith one. Uh, of course, our cousin Cam, just him hitting a pitch shot is a, a thing of beauty. And he's won, won many golf tournaments with his wedges. So we'll take a look here at Cam Smith pitching it. And Mitch, you can kind of get into one thing that I noticed that a lot of amateurs don't do. And I'm sure you'll talk about it. So let's let's roll that. We had to cut off a lot of this video to get Kepka's caddy's ass out of the way. <laughs> so he's starting with his weight a little bit forward, which I really like. Um, and just his body control and the way he rotates through towards the target is, I think, what Spencer was talking about that 90% of amateurs do not do. Um, you can see, even though it's a very short golf swing, his belt buckle is still facing the target when he finishes that golf shot. And he just has a great rhythm about him, great consistency. His, his club's in a fairly neutral position, but uh, like we were talking about earlier with the full swing, you can, it, like once you get down to a consistent enough move where your club face can dictate your, your ball flight, um, I think that's what Cam does a really good job of is, and some I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I, like on my short game, the only thing I really like to change is my ball position and where my club, like how open my club face is. Like I'm not trying to manipulate a whole lot else because then there's too many moving parts. Like I can still hit a, a high shot with the same type of swing that I'm using to hit a low shot. There's not a lot of like flipping under it. You're not, in, unless you're in a bunker, which is a totally different scenario, but um, you, you can still execute different heights of shots and shots that carry further shots that don't um shots that spin and shots that don't things like that by just manipulating where where you're where you're set up with the ball in your stance and then also what wedge loft you have and where how open the club face is at at address so um i just like that he's super consistent you rarely see him make like a, a weird move it's just very repeatable it's very neutral and he always rotates through into that left side no matter how short the shot is and that's that just gets lost with the amateur golfer yeah well one thing too that i noticed and that you don't see a lot of kind of what i was alluding to was how close together his feet are and how like tight he is just with his entire setup and that's something that you try to teach, you know, generally like one of my first things in a chipping lesson was always, hey, let's, you know, get your stance a little open depending upon the shot and let's let's get your feet a little closer together. But his feet are borderline, I think, touching each other. Like there is no room in between either of his shoes. And he's one of the better, you know, if not the best. Yeah, it's 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 muddled now with Liv and, and PGA Tour, but one of the best chippers and pitchers of the golf ball there is around. Yeah, one hundred percent. And that a lot of that stems from. Um, I mean, I chip with my feet basically touching each other, and most better golfers do because when you're you're making that short of a swing, a lot of people don't realize when your feet are shoulder width apart, you have virtually no lower body mobility. 
So your, your knees and your hips are super stiff and that creates a very upper body type swing um, where your arms are going back. Nothing's, nothing's actually rotating. Kind of the theme of this whole episode, it seems like, is rotating, um, which everybody could use a little bit more of in their golf swing. But yeah, not mad about it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. If we could get that out into the public eye and just get more people learning about that, um, we probably have to give a few less lessons. But uh, just, Oh, shit. Uh, never mind. Yeah, Mitch doesn't know what he's yeah. talking about. Yeah, no, you, you want to keep those feet about <laughs> three feet away from each other. Um, yeah. but no, it, it just gives you that much more mobility in your knees and your hips in order to make that rotation back and, and have your knees change flex. So uh, on the back swing for a right-handed golfer, your left knee is flexing and your, your right leg is straightening a little bit. And then transversely on the way through that left leg is going to straighten your weight's going to get over into your left heel and that, that right knee is going to rotate around to that left knee. So, uh, keeping the feet to even the feet closer together is very, very beneficial um, on those shorter shots just to, to be able to build some sort of rhythm. Absolutely. Um, one thing, if you guys don't mind, I'll make it quick. Um, I've seen plenty of footage of him, uh, Cam Smith, hitting pitch shots. And one thing that is not in that video, because it's probably make it way too long, is his uh, little pre-shot routine that he does. Um, and it was really cool. This other video that I'm referencing is that I teach this all the time and I'm sure you guys do as well, but at, well, he's hitting a pitch shot. You want to focus on where you want to land the ball, understanding that it's going to land and roll to the hole. That part's kind of easy. What he does and what I try to preach every single day of my life is that you need to look at your landing spot and make rehearsal swings while looking at the landing spot. It's too easy to look up and see that big, beautiful flag where the hole is and what they're doing is they're programming themselves to take a swing large enough to land it at the hole. I see every amateur do this. Oh, a, excuse me, let me back that up. Almost no amateur looks down range anyway, when they're doing her systems, they just look at the ground. But when they do look up, they do that quick peak, quick peak. And they, all they see is the flag. So what Cam Smith does really well is he looks at his landing spot. He takes a realistic looking swing that should get him to said landing spot. And then all he does is he steps up and he executes the same exact swing. The length wise is what I'm talking about. Like the length of his swing. Uh, I think amateurs can learn a ton from that. Yeah. Chipping and putting I've seen teaching high school kids that we are kind of getting into golf and, and you, or just playing around with some random person. I, I, one of my favorite things, um, and we will, uh, we'll do a little roast session at the end. So you guys both be thinking, of, <laughs> thinking about a few things that you can roast of either clients oh, or, you know, people. we're not going to name any names or just people you played with. Um, but I love the, the two footer that they, you know, they just putted it from 30 feet. They have a two footer, they walk up to it. They're not, you know, it's not a gimme they, well, if they're not scooping it up and not thinking it's a gimme, they take right. a practice putt, like they're about to hit an 80 footer and then just go and dink the, like jab at the two footer. Like yeah, it just drives it me insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It drives yeah, me dude. absolutely insane. Uh-huh. I mean, that, I actually so much chunked a, a putt or two back in the belly putter days. I did drop kick a few putts, so. <laughs> I can't talk too much shit because I, I would like stick it in the ground. I don't know if I just like exhaled and my gut pushed the putter into the ground and like I couldn't keep the putter airborne, but that thing just you fucking know, I never stuck thought in the ground. Before. Yeah, that has so, to be the reason why I chunked the ball right there. I think I figured it out exactly. That that's I, I have excuses. <laughs> okay, they're valid. So, um, yeah. We, but. Well, we've oh. had uh, we've had valid excuses all year for not being able to hit bets, but this last week was finally our week to hit a winner on the DraftKings sportsbook, thirty-five Dang. to one with Chris Kirk. We also hit Dang. three three different guys in the top ten with Shane Lowry, also Chris Kirk, and uh, Seamus Shane, Power. Shane Lowry. Sh uh, yeah, Sh <laughs> Shane, you are Shane Lowry. I've never thought of That's that. Right. That's you right. are a literal teaching version of Shane Lowry. I love right. that. I don't, yeah, I don't like mowing grass though. So. 
Um, but you guys can do that at the DraftKings Sportsbook. We post every week on our Instagram um, our card for the week. We call it Big Bet Energy. Um, we are ha- we have fun with it. Of course, every single golf tournament you can bet on. The NFL is no longer a thing this this time of the year. So what better to watch on the couch on Sundays than an entire golf tournament? That's what I spend my Sundays doing. You guys can too. I actually got into the weeds this past weekend betting, live betting hole scores for Chris Kirk and Eric Cole. Um, it was pretty bad, but it was fun. Uh, I was just sitting on the couch and just logged into the DraftKings Sportsbook and was just live betting the shit out of it. I knew uh, if Kirk Holt <laughs> held on, I was getting that that big payout. So you guys can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the promo code DNVR. All you have to do is bet $5, and you get $200 in bonus bets instantly. I would recommend taking those bonus bets and heading right over to the Masters, picking a couple of winners. We'll give you guys some of those. We also have the players coming up, a lot of big golf tournaments, and you can make some money on those, whether it's top 10 bets, top 20 bets, um, a player to beat another player. There's so many options, and they're all at the DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA and many other sports with the code DNVR. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions do apply. See show notes for details. Also, we're brought to you by our presenting sponsor, the guys over at Pins and Aces. Andy, you're going to have to give us your shirt size. You can do that off camera if you'd like, and we'll uh, <laughs> we'll get you some Pins and Aces gear. We always oh, like to send some medium. stuff to our uh, to our guys on the podcast. So um, it does fit yeah. a little small. Just a heads up. Yeah, I got Mitchell oh, and XL to bring maybe down we'll to go just air- a regular large. Then. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, but it's only a medium, so I. Maybe large would be good for you. Yeah, Pins and Aces is a Colorado-owned golf brand. They are the presenting sponsor of Big Drive Energy, but also a DNVR golf conglomerate, hopefully going to be a sponsor of basically all of all city here soon. So uh, Pins and Aces is the best golf gear. I've got their hoodie on right now. It's super comfortable. I've got the hat on. Mitch has got the hat on. Uh, we're going to send Andy some gear. He does have a fire polo, but Pins and Aces has got some stuff. Uh, they're constantly coming out with new stuff. They've got the Yeti. Uh, line that they just dropped. I don't know if it's quite sold out yet, but they've got the Yeti head cover, some new vests for those of you that are in the colder weather. And then, of course, they've got the beer sleeve and the liquor stick, two of the craziest, most awesome products that any golfer could want as a uh, as a guy that likes to go out and enjoy himself on the course as well as you know, actually trying to play some good golf sometimes, the liquor stick is by far the best product. So make sure you check out pinsandaces.com. Use our promo code BDE. That'll save you 15% off plus get you free shipping. All right. Now we're about to get into demonstration mode. Andy's got the uh, the simulator behind him. We're going to talk about some... One of the things, you know, we're going to get into definitely different, different instructional things here, but one of the things we kind of wanted to touch on is some drills you can do at your home or just in an area, wherever that ends up being your work, you know, always be golfing type of scenario um, and not necessarily need a golf club and just use some like random objects in order to uh, practice your swing. So Andy, you want to go through a few of those with us? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll use a golf club for some of them, but you can, you know, you can use a wooden spoon. You can use anything, use a broom. Um, but just a couple of, just a couple of easy things to do in the off season to make sure that when you do come back to golf season, that you don't have, you know, a shit ton of stuff to work on just to get back to like base level. So, um, let's work on something kind of easy. We're not going to use that stick just yet there. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Still? Yeah, we gotcha. Okay, perfect. So, so far we've talked a lot about rotation and I want to definitely touch on the rotation and the backswing to start because you definitely don't need a club to do this. Uh, you can use a club, but you don't have to swing it in case you can't hit golf balls in the house. But I'll start by facing the camera it looks here. And this is super easy. You've probably seen it before. Might as well see it again. But club up across the shoulders. All you are trying to do is turn 90 degrees with the shoulders. So you're going to keep turning, turning, turning. If you can work in front of a mirror, even better. If not, flip your phone around so you can see yourself. But what so many people do is they come up short of 90 degrees. It looks a lot like this, right, Mitch? Yep. Looks a lot like this. And then they're trying to put a full power swing down in from there, but they're so far out of position to begin with. So again, 90 degrees back, get really comfortable here. Put a ball on the ground while you do it so you understand what it feels like to turn 90 degrees and still see the ball there. You're not gonna lose eye contact, I promise. If that proves to be really difficult, time to start stretching the back out. Uh, that one's pretty easy. So 
that's the backstroke rotation. And if you just make that comfortable, make it second nature, it's way less work to do when you guys get back in sunshine. Re real All quick, right? Andy, one thing I just want to add to that. Um, yeah. If you'll notice, do that one more time for us. Um, because I want someone. people to really see that, like, when you're making that full rotation, watch your left knee. It's coming back towards oh, yeah. your right. That, that's a good indication of making that turn, whereas if you're, if you're coming up short of that full turn, usually your knees are going to stay pretty far apart. Like, yep. Yep, exactly. exactly. Yep. Like the 100%. knee goes, there's a probably better view, that knee goes more over the toes, which is not, not what we want. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, exactly that that knee is working the left knee is working back towards that right knee a little bit which is allowing that right hip to go back behind you so i i really do like that and i think i just like the knees as like an indicator of how far you're turning and and it's something yeah. you feel like you can feel a little bit um as a smaller right. muscle but i really do like that one even even with how simple it is and how much you everyone's heard it you know it's it's something right. that's huge it is huge. And the whole point would be is to just get comfortable with it. Make, force yourself to do it. And honestly, practice going past 90 degrees with your shoulders. Practice going too far with your knees and your hips. So that when you actually yep. pick up a club and you hit a driving range, you're going to feel like you're getting all the way back there. And maybe you're getting to 90 degrees. So that's a super, super important one. Um, I think to complement that, uh, unless Mitch, do you want to take over? Or am I doing all of them? No, you're doing all of them, bro all two of them, right? So, um, so I think to complement that is your, your next piece is to rotate again, but it starts to happen in a downswing. Now, I'm going to make it simple because this is a super complicated move, and we've already talked a bit about it, so hopefully the listeners are gaining some awareness of what we're even shooting for here. But let's say we've already made that full turn. The knees are coming in, the knees coming in, the hips coming back. We've got 90 degrees. One thing that happens in Mitch and, and Spencer, you guys know this, is people uncoil from the top down. Now there's, there could be a myriad of reasons as why, but they start their downswing with their chest and their shoulders and the hips and the knees are an afterthought. But as we saw with uh, the swings that we've evaluated already, is they do the exact opposite. So they're all coiled up and they start moving their momentum to the target and they're uncoiling their lower body and that upper body is still way back. So when they do that, you're creating all kinds of stretch, all kinds of speed. So you can literally practice it with the club up across the shoulder still, all without having to hit a ball, take a full back swing with the club. But we wanna see that full coil, start the momentum going with the knees, the hips, then the shoulders come through last. You guys, how do you guys feel about that? I really like that one. Um, and one thing that, uh, like, I really like that you're doing, and we're, we're talking about, you know, not getting the hands shooting out in front of you in transition and creating that right. over the top move is I like right. when you're, when you're taking it to the top of the swing, it's like getting your hands up. If you're standing up against a wall with your a wall behind your butt is keeping mm -hmm. your hands somewhat up against that wall a little bit longer. Oh, yeah, like, back here. Exactly. And the hands are more running yeah. down the wall and staying on the wall instead of shooting out in front of you in transition. So um, yep. if you could show us what that would look like, Andy, I think that would be a good one too. Absolutely. You guys see me okay up here? Yep. Yep. All right. So what, yeah, what Mitch is talking about is all the way back. The hands back here is saying, pretend there's a wall right here. Most amateurs, their first move is out and away from the wall as opposed to slide them down the wall for six inches or so while you're yep. doing that that gives your body time time we're back to that timing thing rhythm thing this is why pros make it look so easy they do all this but they can do it at 120 miles an hour with a driver back here let it come down the wall now i'm rotating through i i posted a video uh, a couple days ago about the sequence of a downswing and I'll just finish with that because it could be a good one. Super easy. Because here's my wall that I'm going to stand next to. Okay. Is that, is that good with the light or not really? Yeah, we got that, you. That's a great visual. Okay. So you can see the stick okay? Yep. 
Are you asking right, if so we can we see that. your stick? Is that what you're asking us? Uh, yeah. This is a family-friendly podcast. Oh, yeah. What is the age group of this podcast? <laughs> okay. um, so we go full turn all the way back. And what there's going to be is there's going to be a race, a race to the wall. Okay, there's certain body parts and club parts that you want to come in certain places. So <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> – let's scratch this that one. I, who knows, man? You got me on a bad train here. We'll okay. put this on only so fans we're going to go hips, <laughs> hips to the wall first. And then we're going to go butt of the club to the wall second. And then club head to the ball last. And if you can just get those body parts to go one, two, and three, one, two, and three – you're going to be getting a lot better. And you don't have to do it with a golf club. You could do that literally with just your body. Yeah, I like that. That's really good for sequencing, for feeling what parts should be moving when. Um, and, and like you said, activating the hips and getting the hips rotated earlier, I think is a huge help. Um, that a lot of people, like you said, they're moving their upper body first. That is another reason why their hands are, are shooting out in front of them. Um, yeah. And, and with that, that wall one, too, that I had you do, what I really like is the thought of making sure your hips are still rotating open while you're keeping your hands on that wall. So you can feel yeah. kind of your upper body's almost turning into your arms is a, is a way I like to think about it, where That's your arms one. are staying back and your, your chest is turning into your left bicep more, whereas a lot of amateurs, you'll see a lot of the time they get all that separation with their, their lead bicep and their chest because their hands are coming out in front of them versus allowing your, your left bicep to really stay connected to your chest and pushing your chest through impact. So then your, your rotation is outracing your hands as, as you were just saying. Right, right, yeah. It, every time a, a student starts to get even a little bit better at that, it just has massive benefits. So, um, it because it, you're just taking their normal sequence and you're just working slowly to change it and go in the opposite. And again, there's a thousand reasons why you guys do that. So I, I remember we were going to talk about why the people suck at golf so much. And the first thing I was going to say is because they don't get help. They don't get proper help. They just don't. So I understand yep. that we make the quick videos, the funny videos, uh, and they're all good tips. But if that, if that person doesn't know what they're supposed to be working on right now with their current issues, then Every video they watch, it just gets harder and harder. So get some help first from a trusted professional, and then the stuff just gets so much easier. You at least know what you should be focused on. Yeah, yeah. one thing I think is really important about what you said is you you know, you know, post a ton of videos, and go check it. Plug your, your TikTok is Andy Morris Golf, right? Yep, and, and, and Instagram. And Instagram. So make sure you're following yep. at Andy Morris Golf. Uh, he's always got great tips, but – as great of a teacher as you are, and you know, as great of a teacher as Mitchell is, I'm not gonna put myself in that same category. There's, there's, you know, if, let's say you have 50 videos. Well, one person may only fit into two or three of those video categories or, or things that they need to work on specifically in order to get themselves better. And that's why, you know, it's huge to, like you said, go, you know, consult a professional. I'm sure you, you teach online too, right? Skillist. I do. Yeah. I use on Skillist. Yep. Yeah. So he, so Andy can, you know, you can send him your swing and he can help you specifically because as great as a, as a tip video is, this is where 90% of golfers get into the weeds is they, they see a trick on youtube or whatever which is great you know we're we're making money we're doing that's like our job right now right we're we're right. making money right. off of making tips and and making videos on youtube but the the overall arching idea that every single video you make will help every single person with every single problem is is impossible so that that's one of the big things is trying to get an idea of like what your issues are and and that's something that's good for even somebody to research you know if you don't want to go get a lesson which is not recommended but some people just don't <laughs> try to figure out what you're you know what you're doing like if you're s slicing the ball or hitting it fat and then look for you know look for videos or tips on on those specifically and i know one yeah. thing that you had um and then you did some videos on a couple weeks ago or a video is contact so can you get into that for just a little bit of like good ways to make solid contact with the ball, which sounds so simple, but is really like an, <laughs> an extremely form, important man. concept. Yeah. Uh, this will, that's good because this will pertain to that, that second portion of what I was just doing up there is, I mean, again, thousand reasons why you don't make good contact, but 
uh, bar none, I'm sure Mitch would agree with this, is that no one is comfortable nor understands how to move the club into the ground after the golf ball. So and most people don't know that's what you're supposed to do. They think it's ball only or ball and ground at the same time. I've literally even heard, oh, I thought you're supposed to hit the ground before the ball. So if we can, I'm not joking. <laughs> I've taught a lot of lessons. The yeah, shit, the shit you hear, things. yeah, it's, it's a Dude, bananas. Yeah, yeah. I think I haven't officially tracked it, but I'm seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 lessons in now. Um, and so, yeah, I've heard a few things. Uh, but so just knowing that, that helps a lot. And so then if you relay it to what I was just doing up there of like moving closer to that wall, it's like if you start your hips in kind of like your rib cage and you're moving that closer to the wall, but before you have started to actively swing the club down to the golf ball, that's the kicker is so many people are like that club's in our hands. We want to go use it. So they start using it right away. You've had no time to rotate, no time to transfer any sort of weight forward. So now the likelihood of you hitting the ball before the ground goes into the shitter. So um, that's a basic explanation, but if, if you just know that you're supposed to hit the ground after you hit the golf ball, start practicing that. Just practice that. Set a ball up next to you, but swing in front of it and watch yourself hit the ground after the golf ball. And then eventually you slide the golf ball in the way. It takes a minute, but that's, I mean, that's, I can do, I can do more, but that's, that's the gist of it. Yeah. And, and talking about that is one of the drills I think you did was putting a towel behind the golf ball. And that's a huge, like, it's just a mental thing where it's like, nobody, yeah. like, they think they're going to hit the towel, but then when they don't, they real you realize that your club is coming down, you know, at the golf ball and then especially making contact with the ground after the golf ball, because they're so worried about hitting that towel or hitting that object behind the ball mm -hmm. that they end up making that move in the correct manner. And it, it's not as hard as you think it is, but when you right. don't make your like when you don't test yourself on it and you just try right. to do it it's a lot harder than if you're like hey you know <laughs> i had i heard this joke once and it was actually one of our members and he goes you know why golf is so hard to get good at he like and he i was like well why he's like because it's it's not like you know motocross where if you fucking miss a jump short you're you're gonna you know rack yourself in the balls and be hurt oh. for <laughs> you know golf doesn't hurt you to not yeah. be good at but there are things drills that can they, they not necessarily you don't want to hurt yourself, but they're drills that can like almost scare you into doing what's correct versus just like consistently doing the incorrect thing over and over 100%. again. But when you have a drill there or you have a, a, a training aid, it's like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be done. And kind of relaying that into one thing that you guys can touch on a little bit is, yes, you like you said at the very beginning of this podcast, like, yes, you need to play golf. Like that is the ultimate key of this. But I think one of the biggest things we can all you know, help golfers with in and teaching inside and not actually having, you know, a legit course and whatnot is there the motion of the golf swing is so much better for any individual when it's just consistent and you can get consistency of motion in any part of the golf swing, never hitting a ball and never, totally. and never giving yourself that negative idea in your head of like, you did everything correct, correct motion wise, but you didn't make great contact. So then you think that you didn't hit it well. That is an absolute killer of progress, man. Maybe, potentially, maybe the number one killer of progress is, especially when they get a lesson and all you do is hear them shit talking their instructor because they didn't start striping it in five minutes. It's like, uh, but now you, you just take the average golfer. Maybe they had a lesson, maybe they didn't, but they start practicing and, well, golf is going to beat them up. It's, there's, golf's the equalizer of any sport. I mean, take LeBron James. I think there was footage of him swinging a golf club. That man's potentially the best athlete of all time, but you hand him a golf club, he looks funny. He looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. But you, anyway, that's a little besides the point. But you, you hit a shot, it goes horribly, you chunk it, you swing and miss, you hit it so far right, and their brain instantly says, that's wrong, let me change it. And it's like, no, you just learned how to turn. You just learned how to do this. You're not going to make good contact. It's not going to go straight at first. But what I tell my students is like, look, there's a, there's a probability – don't know what it is, but there's a probability that you are going to learn this new move and it's going to work. There's a much larger probability that it's not going to work as far as results goes. And so what happens though, is like there's one window of probability and they tried it and it didn't work. So they switched to something else. Now here's a new window of probabilities that that's going to help or not. And then, but they keep switching it. 
So they're looking through a different door of probabilities every single time and making no headway at all. And as they just would have stayed down that first door, hopefully if it was a good tip that they're supposed to work on and just keep pushing, they finally start to get it, but they just go door to door to door to door. And that, yeah, that's why it takes 30 years for these people to, to break 100, to break 90, to feel confident about their game. Yeah, 100%. And I think like what both of you guys are talking about is everybody is naturally just results oriented. Everybody wants to see results immediately. And so a lot of people don't really realize that even subconsciously what's happening to their body and their golf swing is they are their body subconsciously moving in different ways in order to, to hit the golf ball at all costs, no matter what, no matter what it takes. They're just physically trying to make contact from any position that they're in. So when you're, t when you're making dry repetitions, like dry without the golf ball, um, you're, you're removing the results from the process. You're, you're not, you're focusing on the process in, as, as opposed to, having a results oriented thought about it. And so I think you can really actually improve that way as opposed to, um, you know, cause it, it's easy to tell someone don't, don't care where the ball goes. Like, don't worry about it. And a lot of people right. can, but some people just physically, like if, if you're trying to get to the golf ball, they're going to revert back to what they know in order to make mm -hmm. contact because maybe they can't physically make contact with what you're telling them to do, even though it's the right thing to change to. So uh, removing the golf ball is huge and in, in doing dry repetitions, um, like we talked about at your house, at the office, uh, you know, off of the golf course is essential for, for getting better and for actually making yep. improvements in, in your, the way your body moves instead of just going out and trying to make contact because that's going to lead you down the same path you've been on for however long you've been playing golf? 100%. Um, I think at-home practice is extremely underrated. Um, and it's by no fault of their own. You know, these people, they don't know what they don't know. So it's they're like, oh, well, you're supposed to go to the driving range. So they do it, and they do it, and they do it. And they spend hundreds of dollars just on range balls, thousands of dollars. and But they're not seeing any difference in their goals. But yeah, it's, it's extremely underrated to just practice at home, change how your body moves and feels. And if you can swing a club, well then yeah, we want you to swing it, but remove the golf ball so that you can focus solely on the process of turn more, put the club here, put your wrist there, turn the body there, whatever it is. Yep. 100%. Love, love that. All right, well, before we get out of here, we're going to do some some roasting. So there's all these things okay. we see, and I know you see a ton of it. Obviously, you don't have to uh, name any names, but we need I need some stories. I need at least one or two good stories of some things that you've seen, or just like when you happen to be playing during the summer, just anything around the game of golf. We, we've basically built our TikTok mm. channel on roasting people going into the pro shop. So let's Which start roasting. Brilliant, by the way, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> let's start roasting some people when they come for lessons. I want I want some stuff from both of you guys. Okay, M Mitch, do you have one right off the top of your head? Um, I, I'm working through. Oh, so I, I do have one. Um, I had a lady that came to me this last year, and her husband had bought her a ten year, ten year, ten ten lesson package. Ten years. <laughs> oh, I I would be on. <laughs> I would be on some sort of watch list because I'd be fucking crazy at this point. Um, yeah. But she she would never hit an iron off the ground. Like, she was always teeing up her irons, like, three inches off the ground. And I'm Sorry. like, you know, this is not how golf works, right? <laughs> like, you, she's like, well, I just keep – like, I can't hit them off the ground, so I just tee them up. And I'm like, so – and she played a lot of golf. Like, she was like, yeah, I mean, my husband went and played, like, twice, three times this week. And I'm like, how do you ever hit an iron? Because she was just the typical, like, stay on your back foot. Like, she played a lot of competitive softball. So she was just completely, like, Barry Bonds off her back foot, swinging so far up. And she, yeah, and I, 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 she still, like, would not let me help her hit an iron off the ground and i'm like well you, you you know you just wasted like 500 right or whatever they spent because if you're not going to let me help you get better 
Like when people just flat out, like when they're not good at something, so they just don't want to touch it. It's like, right. no, that's not how you get better. So her yeah. just avoiding something because she thought, and I, I, unfortunately, I don't want to group anyone together individually, but I hear a lot more from women than from men. They just flat out go, I can't do that. And I'm like, who's saying you can't do that? Like, right. You, right. like even our mom has done it when I'm helping her with her swing. I'm like, you need to do this. She's like, I can't do that. And I'm like, what do you mean I can't do that? Like, yeah. you, can't do you could, you just don't want to. There's a difference between those terms. So uh, that that is something that just frustrates the shit out of me is when <laughs> somebody just flat out tells me, like, I can't do that. I'm like, I wouldn't tell you. I'm not telling you to, to put your head in your asshole. Like, I know you can't physically yeah. do it. It's something um, that you can do. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean – Metaphorically speaking, everybody on the driving range has their head in their ass, but uh, <laughs> not physically. So yes, when water I tell not somebody wet to there, physically but... do something, it's something I know that they're capable of doing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not asking them to dunk a basketball. I'm just asking them to to maybe like rotate a little bit better or yeah. face their target on the follow through, you know, shit like that. Yeah. Like not take the tee out of the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly man fucking just hit that iron off the ground um yeah. so yeah that that is one of my my favorite things is just when i hear i can't do that because it's such horseshit yeah it is um let's see i uh there was one time i had to i all the time we tell people hey slow down like slow down during your swing slow down in between shots because there's no shot you're even thinking anything remotely close to what we're working on so slow down i legitimately after i told a guy at least two or three times like dude you gotta like, you gotta slow down because you're not getting close to anything that we're trying so slow it down right and this guy goes well how am i supposed to hit my ball or you know, how am i supposed to hit like the, as many golf balls or something he said something like well, then I'm not going to hit any golf balls. And I said, are you paying me uh, over $100 an hour so that you can hit 100 golf balls? <laughs> are you shitting me? A bucket of balls like, is a lot cheaper than a lesson. Dude, that's what I said. I was like, you realize you could have done this for $10. And he just, he like whipped his head around me and apparently no one's ever talked to him like that or something. But I was like, you could literally, yeah, I, I could not believe the words out of his mouth. Uh, so I mean that's that's just one off the top of my head. <laughs> how, how am I supposed to hit a hundred balls or whatever he said? Because <laughs> he was I mean he had three balls in the air at once. He was just cr I mean scoop scrape scoop scrape. Yeah, oh there God. there is that group of people that thinks that just like they have a number in their mind where they've heard somebody say like you need to hit ten thousand golf balls in order to like become a single digit handicap or you know become scratch or whatever, and so they just have this image in their mind like. It doesn't matter how I do it. It's just if, if I do it. Just it's like, do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, how do you think that works that way? And actually, the same lady I was just talking about, she did the same shit. She, she was hitting 80 golf balls every half hour. Like, that's nice. <laughs> literally, like, her fucking seven iron teed up three inches. That thing was gone. That thing hadn't that's, even touched the ground yet. And the, other, the next ball right. was already teed up. Which made it that That's much hard on the back, you know, teeing it up every time and also still hit golf balls that quickly. But yeah, it's the old quality versus quantity thing gets very lost on the lesson tee. Yeah, it can. I had an entire 45 minute lesson when I was probably just started teaching four or five years ago. And the lady actually made contact with one golf ball. I wanted oh, to uh, disintegrate into the ground. Oh, like, like just fa finally foul tipped one. Yes, like an entire 45-minute lesson, 100-plus swings, one contact with a golf ball, and it went four feet. Spencer, didn't you Man, give somebody the shanks? I feel bad laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's funny. Uh, oh, yeah, that that's another one. I, I This guy was actually striping it pretty good, and I have this issue, which is why I don't teach a ton of golf anymore. If you want a short game lesson with me, uh, which we are actually going to do. Mitchell and I are going to do a short game clinic at One Shot Back, which is like a, a whiskey bar with some simulators in it here in a couple weeks. So um, nice. I, short game, I feel like I'm pretty good on. Um, but any not good physically. Like I, I my short game sucks. A uh, general lesson on the short game I feel okay with. But yeah. I'm a, a overanalyzer. And somebody will be hitting it good for five to ten minutes straight. And then I'll, like, they'll hit one bad. And I'll be like, oh, no, no, no. Like, like 
Why don't you try this? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like you guys could roast me on giving a lesson. Like that would be actually hilarious. Um, but yeah, I, I gave this guy the full on shanks because I like tweaked one thing. He shanked like eight balls in a row. And then just, I was like, we got to be done. He's like, yep. And he, he thought the same thing. <laughs> It oh was, man! Did he come I back for like, a second lesson? I wonder. Yeah, no, I didn't get a re. That was not a repeat customer there. <laughs> the repeat customers for Spencer were generally the forty-five to sixty-five-year-old women that just like wanted to hang out. Adore with him. him. Adore yeah, him. Yeah, I, I, there's a, a place for that. There's a place for that in the golf world too. Um, but coming, <laughs> somebody coming to you for your instruction at the end of the day is a nice feeling. It is, man. It is when they're definitely hitting you up and being like, Hey, like, when can I get back in? And you know, if, if for some reason they've lapsed for a few weeks or a month or so, it's like, okay, cool. cool. Yeah. Do you have a, um, Andy, do you have a player or a shout out you want to give that you're like somebody that you're teaching right now or have been teaching for a little while that you're just seeing like crazy, uh, crazy, like m m progress from them? That'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, I actually just had him to this morning. Uh, Alex, he's, uh, he's a junior. He lives in Washington state. So he comes down here for sessions and, uh, he'll be giving state a run this year. So, um, really excited for that. He's been crushing it. If he just stays focused, he's going to, he might take state this year as a junior. So for Washington. That's awesome, man. That's so sick. What's, what is, uh, what has been like his, do you know his progression of like where he started high school, like handicap index wise, or where he is now? He, let's see, I, I started by teaching his older brother. And so by the time I saw him, cause he was kind of like learning through his brother who was learning from me. So that was actually kind of nice. Had a lot less to talk about when him and I started, but uh, he started probably around like a 12-ish by the time I saw him, was like officially working with him. Uh, he's down to a 0. 0.8 or 0. 0.3, excuse me, 0. 0.3. That's that's so sick, man, and that's yeah. How, like, give us an idea too, because most people don't understand. Like, w what kind of time is he putting in? Is he just like mm. obsessed with it? Is he what 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 sort of time throughout the week does he put in on it? Yeah. So to give everybody a perspective of what it takes to go from even even just to get to a twelve, but twelve to basically scratch, it, he's living the dream. He does online high school and he goes to the range a minimum four days a week. And that, within four days a week, him and I talk about his practice schedule a lot. He is hitting golf balls to warm up, working on the move that we're currently working on. And then he goes right over to short game, does his putting drills, does his chipping drills, and then he goes and plays nine holes, if not 18. And so I get it. He's a high schooler that is online high school. I understand you guys do not have the time to do that, but he's also trying to win state, not break a hundred. So, uh, he's going to strike while the iron's hot and, uh, we're looking at schools for him right now. And I got a couple others in the ranks. I got a sophomore that's right on his heels. So, um, hopefully looking pretty good, but that is, that is the type of dedication it takes. If you want to ever sniff scratch or better, it's four or five days a week, if not more. And even when he's at home, I guarantee you, he is practicing his moves subconsciously he's because we're working on a lot hey, you'd probably guessed it we're working on turning through the ball a little better with him he hit the big old slingers for a while so he's compressing the hell out of it now and his ball flight is so pure and so straight just these tiny little draws so that that is so sick man you you love yeah. to hear stories like that and it really just keeps keeps people coming back man and that's the best time to do it and is in high school when you got the time and if you're dedicated, you can you can play golf for the rest of your life. So I love hearing stories like that. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, Andy, Any once again, plug your uh, plug your stuff, plug your TikTok, Instagram page. Um, we'll get the people following you because you. Uh, well, your Instagram is like blowing up, dude. Have you, you've had some. Uh, it's had uh, some awesome. I'm gonna, I'm gonna complain for a second. I'm gonna complain, so I'll make it quick. My Instagram blew up last year. It was nice. I got up to well, big for me. I'm trying to follow in your guys' footsteps. Up to 16K, which is huge. I kind of never thought I'd be there. Uh, and it's kind of hit the brakes for the last couple of months. I've heard that from a few people. So, uh, But it is Andy Morris Golf on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, too. But I'm kind of working on my YouTube game a little bit. But Andy Morris Golf. Hell yeah. Well, go ahead and follow Andy. Thanks for joining us, man. One of our, I Thank think you you're guys. Our, second, our second ever uh, repeat podcast. So oh, our, our second ever uh, 
God, I the the term recurring. Is recurring guests. There we go. Thank you. Mitchell has to <laughs> fill in a lot of my sentences, generally speaking. Um, hey, we're yeah, guys, dude. not English teachers, man. <laughs> no, exactly. And and we loved having you on. And next time, we're not going to make it a full, almost a full year. We're going to make we'll do something with you uh, in the summertime again. So appreciate you joining That's us, perfect. dude. Uh, and if you guys are listening yeah, man, to this podcast awesome. audio wise, make sure to go check it out on the DNVR Sports YouTube. Check Andy out. And if you're watching this on the YouTube, check it out. Check out our podcast at Big Drive Energy on both socials and at Big Drive Energy Pod on Instagram. Thank you guys all for listening. Thank you, Andy. You guys enjoy your next week, and we'll talk to you guys after the weekend. Peace. Thank you, boys. Thanks, brother. That That was a blast.